<clears throat> Hello, welcome to my video sample for my, hold on a second, I'm going to put on a watch. Start over. Hello, welcome to my video sample for my presentation on the topic of project management and product development. This is a variation of my uh, managing organizations presentation and it's specific to managing projects. These can be uh, a variety of projects, um, developing a product, developing a service, a product offering, or doing something like a large scale sort of capital project, building a bridge, something along those lines, any, any sort of big project work. Um, I've given it a different, uh, a separate presentation from organizational uh, managing organizations uh, because I think it's, uh, there are enough specific issues to merit its own presentation. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started. This is, gonna, this is a fun topic for me because I get to put a little bit of my engineering uh, uh, education to work and experience to work. We're going to start off with some of the tools for like project management. We'll talk through some of the decisions you have to make, some uh, management obstacles and, and uh, uh, tricks of the trade, and then we're going to end up with a few tips on product design. And these are mostly um, physical products, but uh, they don't necessarily have to be software. Uh, it can have some of these as well, uh, the services as well. So with that in mind, let's get started. The first thing I want to talk about are, are some of the tools that you can use for project management. One of them is what's called a Gantt chart and uh, this is named after the fa uh, inventor and it's basically a way of visually describing uh, the, the workflow um, uh, with a particular attention paid to the dependencies. So for example, uh, these brown blocks, it's usually a block structure and it'll show you sort of, and there's a time across the top and it'll show you here's how long it'll take this resource, this person or a team uh, to finish this project and then that once they're done they hand off the results to another resource that will do their project and then they can go to work on something else. So it shows these dependencies and there are softwares that can help you do this. Microsoft Project is probably now the most common and the advantage of this is not only do you get to see how long things are taking but you can also uh, if you change one thing all of the dependencies will move as well. So if this ends up taking a week longer and you have to move this back that means this moves back and anything dependent on that will move back. There's also something called a stoplight chart, uh, colloquially known as the happy face chart. This shows you which uh, tasks are on schedule and, and those would be a green light, uh, which ones are uh, a problem and you don't have a solution for it. That could be a red light. And then in the middle, the warning can be a yellow light. That can either mean that um, it's in danger of missing or uh, we have a workaround, in, it was going to miss, but we have a workaround in place. You can define it a little differently. And I like to combine both of these. I like to have a Gantt chart with sort of a stoplight column at the end that shows you which things are on track, or you can change the color of the items in your chart as well to represent what the, uh, what the, whether or not it's on schedule. So those are a couple of tools. You can also use uh, customer input, customer surveys. I talk a little bit about this. This is sort of crossover between my marketing presentation and here, but you have uh, customer inputs and you can decide to go through for the general public, uh, all of the people who will ultimately be a user of your product or service, or you can go with sort of a subject matter expert or the thought leaders. Um, so I have some tips on how to, uh, who you want to survey and how to survey them because, uh, for example, something high fashion, uh, avant-garde, the, the general population, the general user might not be ready for it until the thought leaders have approved and adopted and then they will follow suit. I talk here about the Kano method. This is a sort of a framework for um, determining what things uh, you need to have in your product that you're surveying about. You, for example, Kano says some things are must-haves, you have to have them or don't have them. Other things might be must-not-haves. And then there's also relative things such as, you know, more is better. Horsepower, we might want more power, uh, but uh, it's not like an on or off uh, threshold. And likewise, you can also have more is worse or less is more, things like that. Um, so that's, that's some uh, customer input framework. 
frameworks. And the last one I want to talk about is benchmarking. This is one of the tools you can use to benchmark, to compare yourself to your competitors and see what you have or what you need, how the, and, and you can actually combine these because oftentimes what you'll do is you'll put you know, customers in competitive vehicles and see how they feel uh, back and forth. I use vehicles there like an auto industry example, but that can be another product or service offering. Um, there are a couple of tricks that I, I warn about on benchmarking. One of them is it's important to remember that if you're, if you're benchmarking your competitors, you are essentially comparing how you are like them. And you know, if they're more powerful for their car and you want to be more powerful, so you have to increase your power. But it's important to remember oftentimes strategically, uh, business strategy, you gain a little bit more leverage in the marketplace by being slightly different. So if they're the high power off offering, you become the fuel economy offering. And if you're going after, if you're benchmarking your competitors, the target you're benchmarking is what you're going to emulate. And it, it uh, prevents you from differentiating your projects at sort of carving out a niche. Another thing to remember is oftentimes benchmarking is uh, like, like driving by looking in the rear view mirror. The product that your competitor has right now is usually the one you're comparing to because you don't know what they're going to come out with. But if they're going to come out with something in a couple of years new and you're designing for a couple of years out, you've got to bear in mind that you're chasing, you're, you're actually chasing a moving target. If you, if you bring out a, a product that's just as good as their current one two years from now, they will have leapfrogged you because they'll be on their next generation beyond that. It's a couple things to bear in mind on benchmarking. Next thing I want to talk about is some of the decisions that you have to make when you're managing projects. Uh, some of those decisions are around the organizational design, what organization you want to use. Um, sometimes if you're developing a product or a service, you want to have an independent team, an independent organization working specific on that product or service. And the advantage of that is they're very dedicated and they're very focused. Uh, at the opposite extreme, you can do it, uh, you can organize functionally. For example, you can have uh, the, the silo of engineering and the silo of manufacturing and you draw uh, one person off of each of those to work on a specific product, but they stay, uh, they're, they're, they're managed by their functional area. Now, the uh, advantage of that is that it's, it's more integrated in the regular process. So an independent organization will have dedication and focus, but it might have difficulty getting the best people because the functional owners don't want to give up their best people to work on a specialized team. It can also be hard to reintegrate because now that the functional areas, the manufacturing plant that has to build this product, might not really want to change their, uh, uh, they're not as vested in it and they might not want to change their process to suit this new avant-garde product. And that can be a particularly important if they have to service current products. The more uh, advanced these products are, uh, the more independent the teams tend to be, but that means that it's harder to integrate and, and the uh, established organization, the larger organization, knows that, uh, look, new things can fail, but you can't, and, and you might get in trouble, but if old things fail, the things that you make all of your current money off of, uh, then you get fired. So they might defer some of the avant-garde stuff to, to continue working on the, uh, to, to continue working on the bread and butter product offerings. Um, and these heavy teams and light teams are sort of uh, hybrids of those. A heavy team is where they ha you sort of like matrix organizations. They have a, a, both a product uh, or project function and uh, a, a skill function like engineering. And they have to report to people in both organizations. But the heavy team skews it a little bit more towards the independent. Uh, the, the independent uh, program takes precedent, the independent manager, whereas the light team, the functional sort of takes precedent. And we can talk about what kind of circumstances you would want to use uh, certain of these options in. Next thing we talk about under decisions is you've got to decide if you're developing a technology that you might use for a lot of products or services or an offering, maybe it's a, a component that's part of a modular design, you have to de decide whether or not you're going to fund that inside or outside the product program. So I'll use uh, car development again. If you're going to develop a new technology, like a new, um, a new type of manufacturing process or a new suspension system, uh, GM invented the, uh, uh, the magnetic suspension, and you have to decide if you want to, do you do that with the product, that it's the first product program that it's going to come out on? Do you fund it through that product program and um, develop it simultaneous? Or do you do it as a separate function and then integrate it into uh, the products as they come out? Now the advantage is um, 
if you develop it inside, you will have the most usefulness. It's, it's developed just, and, and you can oftentimes get it to market faster because it was designed just for that product. But the uh, applicability, it might be spe too specific to that product and it's, not it's harder to change it and ap apply it to subsequent products. Um, you also have to remember that uh, the, the, the program, if you're, if you're using a technology, if you're developing a technology inside your product program, the budget has to be higher. You can't expect them to do new technology with the same sort of budget and resources. But then if you increase them, you have to remember that the next product or project manager is going to say, hey, their budget was X, so mine should be too. And you have to remember, well, you're actually not developing a new technology, so your budget is a half X. So you got to remember to sort of add where appropriate and remove subsequently. Um, the next decision I want to talk about is uh, a gated process versus an iterative process. A gated process is where uh, a, a very sequential process where you design certain components and then once those pass you go to the next stage which is maybe building prototypes and once that's done you go to the next step which is building tooling. When that's done you go to the next step building manufacturing and that goes for software as well. But typically software uses an iterative process. This is like beta testing and you know, we, we developed a, some, uh, a software program. We, we let some of our advanced users use it, our beta users. They give us feedback. Then we put it out on the market and then we start getting crash reports coming back in. And so then we go back out and we uh, have patches to fix it. Now that works better with certain softwares. However, you can't really do that with airplanes. Boeing can't build a bunch of planes, see why they crash, and then go back and fix them. They, they need it. So the more, uh, the more critical components tend to have a more gated process. Life and death, things like that. Um, the last one I want to talk about under decisions is uh, having a dedicated versus uh, an integrated kind of product. This is more of a product decision. We've gone from organization sort of down to the product level now. And the dedicated product, I use, uh, for, for my example, I use these uh, multifunction printers where they can be a fax machine, a copier, a scanner, and a printer all integrated into one. Now, that's the integrated model. The dedicated model would be where you have a separate printer and a separate scanner and a separate uh, uh, fax machine and, and um, I think a separate copier if I got that sequence right. Now, why would you want that? Well, if, you're, if you are looking to tweak performance combinations very specifically like you know the integrated you only get one product and it comes with the specs for each one if you have dedicated products I can buy the scanner with the specs that I like and I like this feature but then I can buy a separate printer because I like that feature about it and I can buy a freestanding fax machine so I don't have to teach people how to use uh, the interface it's simpler and more direct um, but then the integrated is it oftentimes more efficient you're saving space you might be saving money uh, because you don't have to do everything separately and the, um, make sure I got all I wanted to say on that. Oh, also, if something on the integrated product breaks, you have to go get either a separate dedicated or you have to replace the whole thing. If, you're, if your print function breaks, you lose both your printer and your copier. So, or, or if your scanner breaks, you lose the scanner and the copier. So that's something to bear in mind as well. Modular design is kind of a hybrid of those. It's trying to get the best of both worlds. And like uh, all compromises, it can be the best of both worlds or the worst of both worlds. But modular is where like, I, can, I can pull one product out and put another one, you know, if the scanner breaks, I could remove it and replace it without uh, losing my uh, print engine. So those are some decisions that you have to make on product management and pro uh, project management and product design. Now let's talk about some of the management issues that you'll face. One of them is, you know, what's the right way to get the best performance out of team? Do you want to create a sense of urgency and the advantage, uh, or do you want to have uh, leave them some flexibility, some discretionary time. Uh, and this is a really a debate. There, there are creative solutions that have come out of these. Urgency tends to create focus, which oftentimes gets people to, uh, you know, you, you, uh, sort of an Apollo 13 kind of scenario. The, the urgency uh, gets them to really think outside of the box. Um, however, discretionary uh, oftentimes gives them sort of more latitude to explore uh, creative ideas and sometimes they will be more creative with discretionary time if they're diligent employees because they they can experiment a little bit more and the downside of urgency is they can sometimes cut corners the downside of discretionary is they can be late or inefficient or sloppy if they if they sort of pursue some frolics so that's a decision you, that's sort of a decision but it's management specific um, another one is 
uh, the, this is a, an observation that researchers have found out. Typically, you have in, when you're designing or developing a product or service, you have the most influence early in the process, but you tend to defer the attention. The management doesn't pay much attention until it's almost launched. That's when they really get involved. And that's somewhat unfortunate because by the time, uh, and, and this graph sort of represents this, you'll see this in some textbooks, that the influence, the, the ability to impact how much uh, how something is going to perform is highest early. So if you're developing a car, for example, uh, once you decide how many doors it's going to have and how much it's going to weigh, those decisions start to impact, uh, the, 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 everything gets fixed. You can't decide, oh, well, let's go from a four-door to a two-door uh, a day before launch. You've got all the tooling fixed and everything set. However, management attention, which should follow that in theory, actually tends to do the opposite. It tends to start out low and increase over time. And there are several theories for why that is. They might be because the visibility of the project is low early on, but it's really high as it comes time to launch. Also, early on, you could say, ah, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Well, eventually, you get to that bridge but now you've set everything else in motion and things are fixed. Also, there's the blame game. You know, if you, you, you don't want to bring things to blame early, you sort of want to, we'll get to the game of chicken here in a momentarily, but you want to sort of put it off and maybe it'll fix itself, but eventually, uh, you know, the problems that didn't fix themselves you have to deal with, and you, you basically just run out of runway. So that's, the, that's just something to bear in mind, that, that, that you, want to, you want to impact at the point at which the, the cost and the, and, uh, the fat, uh, the, specifications and, and all the things about the product or service are set. Earlier is where you want to, you got to sort of unnaturally force yourself to work earlier, I should say, this direction. Next point I want to talk about about managing is uh, there's some, a scenario called not invented here, which is where people tend to uh, avoid uh, technologies that they didn't figure out themselves because they always, we, we tend to have a bias that our own solutions are the best and if uh, one of our competitors uh, comes up with a better one, we're hesitant to adopt it. I've also seen the other scenario, which is sort of the, sort of the flip side of the same thing, was invented here, which is where the te whatever the solution is, we use it even if it's not the best, even if, it's, uh, 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 even if it's been leapfrogged by the competition. So these are really sort of the same thing, just different ways of describing it. Uh, another management issue you're going to face is what I call a scheduling game of chicken where you know if you've got a Gantt chart like here and several of these resources are going to be late nobody wants to admit it because once you admit it you're the one who gets blamed on the delay and everybody else says well I would have been ready but you know we, we had extra time just because so and so messed up even if they weren't actually going to be ready they needed the same time too so everybody's nobody wants to be the first one to raise their hands and say we're going to be late that's a, a game of chicken and then the last one under management is what I call the scheduling ripple. What tends to happen is if you look at schedules as things go, and this is one of the things that the Gantt chart is intended to try and resolve, sometimes things will start to slip, but nobody wants to admit that the final schedule, the final deadline isn't going to be met. So things get to a crisis point before anybody comes forward and says, look, we need to reset the schedule. Everybody thinks they're going to fix it ahead of time. And, and as these things move, not everything moves back and, and everything just sort of gets compressed essentially because the deadline is, is uh, not being moved. And a Gantt chart illustrates when you really are going to miss that deadline. That's the scheduling ripple. Um, I have a graphic for that that just wouldn't fit on the page. And so those are some management issues now. Some of my favorites. Let's talk a little bit about engineering. I'm going to talk about these from the perspective of uh, uh, physical products, but a lot of these like fault tolerant designs, that can be electronic uh, information technology products as well, software and whatnot. So the first one I want to talk about is what's called being fault tolerant. This is essentially means your design can, can continue to function if, if one of the things breaks and uh, uh, one of the components of it breaks. And this is, uh, that's the fault. And it, it's, I'll give you a couple examples. One of them is uh, the Cessna Corvallis is an airplane and they say that we have no, the, the, the claim that they make for safety is we have no single point of failure. No matter what component on the plane breaks, there's a redundant component that can also do it. Everything's doubled, essentially. And that's what's called no single point of failure. So the flap comes down, it's got three points so that if one of them breaks, the other two can still uh, function properly. Um, another example of this is, what, uh, is run flat tires. 
So if you get a flat tire, you might have to slow down. It's only rated for a certain speed, but you can limp home. It has a limp home mode is what they sometimes call that. And it's important to note, like with run flat tires, sometimes the performance is diminished, but it's still functional. You can get home, or if you're in a plane and something goes wrong, you might have to slow down, but you, can, uh, you, can, you don't have to crash into a mountain. Now let's talk about what's called robust design. This is really, you know, if this is fault tolerant design, you could argue that this is a variance tolerant design. It basically means the, the design of the product tolerates variance in the manufacturing process, the specifications. And uh, I don't know why they call that robust design. I always think robust meaning stronger, and it's not really that, it's tolerant of variance, but it's not my favorite term, but that's the industry term. So let's say you've got something, maybe a, a bolt or a threaded fastener that goes in between two parts here. If you look at this chart right here, you'll notice there are a lot of things that it has to fit. So this has to be smaller than the hole it goes into. This has to be smaller than the hole it goes into. However, uh, if they're both smaller, they, they can ratchet back and forth and rattle and squeak. And if this is too wide, now instead of, you know, either one of these is too wide, it won't work. So you've got two scenarios where it won't fit. This is a more robust design. Uh, still, this bolt has to be smaller than that hole, but you'll notice it, it can sink down. So if there's variance in how they manage to make it, if it's a little too wide, it'll just sit higher. And if it's a little too low, it'll just sit lower. As long as it's bigger than the hole it goes into, it'll stay in place. Also, it won't be rattling back and forth. So that's a, this is a more robust design than that one. And like I said, these can work for software as well. So um, if one uh, piece of IT equipment goes down, essentially the internet, is a fault tolerant design because it was designed to where there's no central area. So if you lose a node in the change in the internet, it, information can be routed through another path. Uh, the, la the next one I want to talk about is what's called design for manufacturing. Sometimes they call it design for assembly if it's specific to assembly. But this is where you want to make sure that your product design is basically able to be built. And that sounds a little obvious, but I've given you an example here to sort of show what I mean. So let's say you have two pieces of sort of bent steel here and you want to fasten them together. And the engineer will draw a, a bolt that goes through them and that will be a nice clean seam because they, the bolt won't be exposed. It'll look good, it's an elegant design. But the problem is if you look at the length of this bolt, you actually can't fit it around the corner because it has to go in. And this is a good, my favorite example because it's very simple but it shows it works on paper. I mean, this bolt does actually fit in those holes. The problem is actually getting it in there. That is not possible. It won't get through. You can't get it around that corner well enough. And so you might have to do something like, well, you know, maybe we'll uh, drill a hole here and then put it in. But now you've got a hole that you've got to drill. Uh, you've added cost. If it, you've added an alignment problem because the hole has to line up properly, maybe that won't work for the function. So you want to you make sure that you, you, you have your manufacturing people tightly integrated into your product development process. And again, this is what used to happen is the designers, uh, the, the engineers would be early in the program and then every, after everything was sort of set and the tooling was fixed, they'd send it to a factory and they'd say, we can't put this together. So you gotta get that management earlier on in the process. And that means getting your manufacturing working in integration with your engineering. Um, the next thing I wanna talk about under product development is using specialized versus standardized parts. Um, specialized parts, if you can make a part specific to one product, um, you can tweak it just for that product. So engineers tend to really like specialized products because they can make it you know, lighter, stronger, just, just what they need but nothing more. Um, and they can, they can hit their you know, weight target simpler, uh, easier by, by, uh, or whatever the specification is. Um, it's also, uh, let's see, I talked about efficient. Um, and you can get better performance potentially, but there's also an advantage to standardized off the shelf parts or parts that you share among all of your uh, products because the advantages there are you, uh, you're you probably cheaper because you have scale advantages, you're making more of them. So per, per unit, it's usually lower. Also, they might be, you have a more reliable supply, especially if it's a standard part in the industry, You then everybody uses it and uh, you're unlike, you know, uh, th there's probably a big warehouse full of them somewhere. You don't have to manufacture your own specialized one. Also, um, your, uh, you'll have to have lower inventory because uh, you don't have, you know, if you need 100 parts as backup, 100 parts as spares, you can use 100 for all of your products, whereas you might, uh, you might have to, if they're all specialized, you'll have to have 100 for each of your products. And the, uh, it's also important to note 
uh, and also like in uh, servicing these products, uh, if they're standardized, if you put the same engine in every car, every mechanic knows how to make, uh, knows how to fix every car. Whereas if it's specialized, they might have to uh, have experts and expertise. They might have to use specialized tools to maintain them rather than uh, off the shelf tools. And it's important to note that one of the problems you run into is engineers, uh, a lot of the problems that you get from going, you know, the, the engineer will feel the problems of standardized parts uh, and they'd rather design a specialized one, but they won't feel the problem of inventory because that's usually not in their department. So the incentives are not always well aligned here. You want to be, make sure you have a responsible manager making the right decisions there um, for the organization, that you don't end up with engineers designing things that can't be built or that have a bunch of specialized parts and then throwing it over the fence and all of a sudden the inventory manager can't do anything about it. The purchasing people miss all of their targets. And the last one I want to talk about is some of my favorite paradoxes of products. Uh, I always say, do you want to make it stronger or do you want to make it weaker? There's an old expression, you know, a blade of grass, uh, the, the strongest blade of, the reason a blade of grass is strong is because it flexes with the wind. If it tried to stand up against the wind, it would break off. And so it's interesting, if you need, want to make something that's more resilient, you can either make it stronger or weaker. Uh, a better product example of that is if you're building a building in an earthquake zone. If you want, you know, one theory is, well, we need to make it really strong so it can withstand the vibrations in the ground. But what they've actually found is what you want to do is make the foundation a little weaker so that it can slide. So that as the ground underneath it moves back and forth, the building can sort of stay stationary because there's some, some, some movement in the foundation. Um, so that's a little counterintuitive. Another one of my favorite paradoxes is, uh, you know, my father always says if something is squeaking or rattling, you can either make it slip more or slip less. So slip more means you oil it, or slip less means you glue it or fasten it into place, because uh, that'll keep something from squeaking. So there's some uh, counterintuitive paradoxes. That is a summary of my, a sample of my project management and product development. If you'd like to see something like this at your organization or event, please contact me at keithwhite.com for a proposal. I look forward to doing business with you. Thank you.